This is the Cover 3 Tailgate. Welcome back to the Cover 3 Podcast here on CBS Sports. That's Tom Fernelli. That's Bud Elliott. I'm Chip Patterson coming to you live at YouTube.com slash Cover 3 and everywhere you get your podcasts on demand. Thanks for hanging out. Smash that subscribe. Smash that like and come and join us in the chat, a.k.a. the Cover 3 tailgate as we sit here and prepare to have our full comprehensive assistant coaching carousel recap. Now, will there still be some assistant coaching moves? Yes. But I do feel like this is a good point for us to uh, take stock of not only the the staffs that have been assembled as recently as like the last two weeks, you know, looking at you, Michigan, looking at you, Alabama, but also to revisit some of those early assistant coaching hires that kind of, you know, made our eyes get a little bit big, like, hello, you're bringing Bobby Petrino back to Arkansas. So from that to this and everything in between, we'll be breaking down uh, some of what you need to know and some of our thoughts on the assistant coaching carousel recap as a whole a little bit later on already in the tailgate some questions about specific teams and coaches you want us to hit, feel free to go ahead and keep filling that up as well. Uh, we'll tackle them later in the show, but first, More news following up on uh, the SEC's proposal of a move to signing day because uh, this week in Indianapolis, uh, various committees are are gathering together. They involve coaches, they involve administrators, conference commissioner representatives, and, and the goal is to take things like what Greg Sankey was talking about and see if we can put together a proposal. So uh, getting this from Pete Thamel right now, there is a new proposal for signing day. And it is not just moving signing day, the early signing period to early December. No, this latest proposal is three signing periods. There would be one, a first signing period that will be the last Wednesday in June, lasting for three or seven calendar days. There will be another signing period. And this lines up with Greg Sankey's proposal. That would be uh, the Wednesday following the last FBS regular season game. And then a traditional signing period beginning the first Wednesday in February. Uh, But the, the groups involved with this are absolutely alphabet soup. I mean, I'm talking the FRS, the AFCA, the FCS, the FBS, the NLI, the CCA. I I am so much more interested in understanding the context and the meat of this proposal than I am with trying to figure out who is actually making the decision, as this is going to be bouncing around from committee to committee. Certainly, how much you, you've been talking to coaches about this. Uh, you know, I've seen coaches retweeting this news and, and weighing in their own opinions on this since Pete Thamel broke it on Wednesday morning. What, what are your thoughts in terms of the viability of a three-signing period uh, schedule for the recruiting process? Chip, I, I think it's totally viable. Uh, if, if they want to run this, that, that's totally fine. The, I'm interested to see how they couch it, and I'm you know, pretty pro-coach, but ultimately like we know that the December signing period came about because coaches did not want to have to recruit over the holidays. You know, and like they would be able to kind of force kids and and pressure them into signing early. I think what you'll see is that coaches will pressure kids into signing in June. Now, there will be some natural repercussions with this, mainly like coaches leaving. So we're going to have to see what sort of outs that they have. Uh, but like we talked about with the potential implementation of a recruit draft, maybe 10, 15 years from now, I don't think it's going to happen tomorrow. It's much easier to screw with the rights of people who are not in the system already, recruits than it is to restrict movement of transfers. So you're probably not going to get very many wins when it comes to the transfer portal. And that is a real headache for coaches right now. And yes, they're paid to deal with it, but it is still a headache and a a major pain. But you can kind of bully recruits into doing whatever you really kind of want them to do. So if this reduces the workload on coaches, I think coaches are going to be all for it. High school coaches, I don't think they're going to love you signing in June because some guys might sit out their senior season. But honestly, if I'm a college coach, that's great. I don't want these guys to sit out their senior season. Oh, you do? You do not want to see I them? I want them to play. Okay. Yeah. No, I, I really want them to play. Like, man, it's, it's a year of development. 
Yeah, exactly. Like you're you're not a year away from from the NFL. The the NIL bag is not the ultimate bag. If you're if you sit out your high school senior season, that is definitely a red flag to me. Why don't we just do one signing day a month? We got three. We're we're twenty five percent of the way there. Why don't we just do it once a month? The, the, the third Wednesday of every month. If you want to sign with your school, just do it. Boom. Ah. You're, you're convicted. You believe in yourself. You've made made more money. I don't think that is. Uh, I don't. I, I don't. I don't think anybody's going to sign up for that, especially if it's binding, right? I mean, if you what if if you've got a scholarship offer and it's committable, and you know you want to go there, why sit around for eight months? Just commit. It's like when you ask your wife what she wants for dinner, and you both go back and forth for twenty minutes trying to figure out what it is, and then you just end up ordering pizza. It's the same thing. Just commit. You know what? Mississippi offered me today. It's been my entire life dream to go to Mississippi. They say it's you know it's it's committable. I'm just gonna do it. It's official. Send in the paperwork. Bam. I'm I'm going to Ole Miss. I will say the chat is pointing out that uh, Texas uh, running back Jaden Blue sat out. Running back's probably the one position where I I would not have a problem with it because like there are certain guys we've seen that I sincerely believe were ready to play in the NFL at 18 years old at running back. Adrian Peterson, Leonard Fournette, Dalvin Cook probably one year off, but like you can't tell me that like 19 year old Dalvin wasn't just as good as like 25 year old Dalvin. So, uh, yeah, I, I guess at that position it, it, I wouldn't hate it so bad, but. Guys already did that before we had this. So, also Texas's running backs rule. I don't know if you guys know that, but that's going to be really fun to watch next year. So, just hey, hey yeah, yeah. Tom's Tom's in his bag right now of uh, players who players who are awesome. It, it's one of the best times actually in the uh, the editorial process where in this time of the calendar before we really start to get into like the meat of all spring practice, we start at the top, which is like players who are awesome. Like I, I'm going to be writing a quarterback wide receiver tandem piece next next week. Just just spent yesterday looking at awesome players. You know, mm-hmm. just thinking about awesome players. So yeah, Texas's running backs will rule. Uh, the timing and the implement implementation, uh, according to this proposal, would be uh, an immediate adoption of the June signing period. In other words, June signing period in June 2024 for those intending to enroll in 2025-2026. Uh, something for them to consider as they continue to look at ways to change the calendar. I saw a little bit of pushback on that first Wednesday in December move. The idea that the conference championship week would be not a great one to have a signing day. I like what we said last show where how many teams are actually participating in conference championship week. I understand this would be a headache for some, but there's only going to be three conferences in a couple of years. I mean, it's, <laughs> true well also yes uh speaking of conference realignment it's still going oh yeah that's right daniel in the cover three tailgate jumping in early this morning two hours before the show started us mac fans welcome you mass just make sure y'all beat kent uh cover three tailgate just Diehard Don says, how about the Mac solving their problem by adding UMass? Do you think UConn is next to make it even numbers? And then uh, also Jackson says, will adding UMass help the Mac have a team finish ranked for the first time since 2016? Uh, we've also had some uh, covered three, like some some big old bag of mail questions that have been like, what will happen first? So something, 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 or uh, Mac finishing with the team in the top 25. Tom. What's UMass to the Mac? And again, uh, the Minutemen will be joining the Mac for the 2025 season. Um, what what does it signal to you? Pos- you know, positive, negative. You know, what what are the big takeaways? Uh, first of all, to answer the one question, UConn will not be joining the Mac. They're not giving up the Big East basketball to join the Mac. Um, I think what I read is Western Kentucky is more likely to be the next team to join the Mac than anybody. But as for UMass, like. Apologies to our friend and Ion College basketball host, Gary Parrish, who was soiling his diaper on TV yesterday about UMass giving up all its tradition of being in the A-10 for years, even though they've been to the tournament once in 25 years. Gary, I don't know how good the Atlantic 10 has been to UMass. I just don't. Anyway, I I think that going to the MAC for them, for football-wise, like they've been... They've been there. Yeah, they've been there, so they're familiar with it, but 
like it's just a completely different landscape now it is pretty much damn near impossible to really be a functional football program as an independent in college football right now unless you're notre dame like you don't have a home everything is kind of aligning towards super conferences you need to get on a life raft or go back to you know fcs or d2 so they found themselves a home i do think that you know it's not like it's going to really improve the Mac. It's not like that it's going to make UMass a better football program because I still think that it is a challenging spot to play football. And I also think that travel-wise, like Buffalo is your closest conference mate, so you're going to be doing a lot of traveling. But just to have some kind of reliability of where the check's coming from, even though that's kind of still up in the air. Like, you have no idea if you're independent, but at least if you're in a conference, you can cross your fingers and hope for the best and think, hey, the Mac – Throughout all of this conference realignment stuff has been pretty solid. It knows its footprint. It knows what it gets. We'll be playing on Tuesday nights on ESPN in DeKalb. It'll be 25 degrees. It'll be windy. It'll be cold. But whatever, we'll be playing football. So I think for football-wise, it makes plenty of sense. And honestly, like I was joking a minute ago with Gary in the A-10, they've struggled in the Atlantic 10. Maybe the MAC is an easier path for them to get back to the NCAA tournament because it's not like the MAC is some, you know, basketball powerhouse conference so i think overall it's probably the right move for umass whether it makes a huge impact for them like athletic department budget wise i i don't know well they 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 held back the one sport in which they're actually good hockey and so, left it um whatever they they currently play and i i was reading this morning so uh the mac does not need to add uconn by the way to even it out because the mac is doing away with divisions mm -hmm. so if you don't have divisions, you really are not required to have an even number of football teams, uh, especially with, with the way the bye weeks are structured now. So I don't think they need to go at UConn. UConn basketball, like UConn football sucks, and they there's no reason to think they're, they're going to be good ever. Like they're just as bad as UMass most years. But basketball at UConn is like legitimately really good. Um, I, Bud, checking yeah. in on the college basketball. People. Hey, look, I, I, I got, I got to write that down. The defending oh, no, 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 no. champions are genuinely good. All I, right, cool. I watch college basketball almost every Tuesday night at, at, after we play softball. And, like, in my opinion, <laughs> Houston is extremely good. Uh, Texas Tech no showed last night against Texas. But, like, I've seen some UConn. Guys, UConn's got, like, some real juice to them. Like, that's not a, a, a prospect. Like, I, I don't want to put that product in the MAC. So I would say UConn should not join the MAC. Ultimately, uh, due to basketball, funny, UMass basketball is not anything special. Um, um, <laughs> so there's Marcus Camby is rolling over in his lounge chair wherever he's sitting. How right? many recruits know <laughs> Marcus Camby is? <laughs> Ooh, but uh, you know, that's where I first discovered some guy named John Calipari. Does the chat know Marcus Camby? If you're under 35, do you know who Marcus Camby is? Under th 30, that might be a really good cutoff. Um, so two things stand out to me a lot. Do you know what the Mac has? The Mac has uh, a TV rights deal that runs through 27. Mm -hmm. Like, if you're UMass and you're just sitting here putting, like, yes, the scheduling is getting more and more difficult, but joining a conference, you know, is the, the scheduling answer. But, Tom, to your point, it, it is a guaranteed paycheck that you're going to understand that you're going to get from that media rights deal. And, like, yeah, there's the big separation and, oh, my gosh, how are you going to be able to keep up? But just fundamentally creating some financial stability I think is important. Number two, uh, the Mac has an identity. Like you are joining a league that college mm -hmm. football fans are going to know uh, like some level of expectation. And so the midweek football in November and sort of Maction and everything that comes with that, you are now getting so much more of an identity that you can be a part of. That's going to help on so many different levels. Again, we are not talking about a program that recruits with the big dogs, but they still do have to recruit they still do have to be able to point to their football team on television for recruits and prospects to be able to say, hey, look, that's us. Uh, the other thing that stands out to me about this is I wonder if the success of New Mexico State in the CUSA was informative to this decision making where New Mexico State jumps into Conference USA. And it is Conference USA that's you know changed its own identity and look over the years, but they jump in. They're competitive, and they get to be a part of this new look Conference USA, which also is putting on some of the midweek football. Though for CUSA, it's mostly in October. Um, you know the Conference USA media rights deal with uh, ESPN and CBS Sports. 
that runs through, I think, 27 as well. Uh, I just I saw this as a big win for UMass football and a sign that being an independent at the FBS level is not going to be sustainable moving into the future. Like, will we have the big breakaway? Maybe. But I'll tell you what's not going to be possible is you being able to lock down over the course of many, many years um, a, a significant media rights deal just for you as an independent. It's it's a better for identity, for money, for recruiting. It's, it's probably better to be able to jump in with the MAC, with Conference USA, and be able to jump on that. Yeah, and, and even going to the independent argument, like it's clearly not going to work long term for UMass, UConn, and those programs. But I think even Notre Dame, like while it can financially survive independently, I think at some point in the future, within the next decade, it's going they're going to have to join a conference too. Because if you do break off into the Super Two or whatever the heck we're going to call them, and Notre Dame wants to remain as an independent, and those two leagues are kind of you know expanding their conference schedules, who the hell is Notre Dame going to play? Like they're going to be forced to join one of the leagues. I mean, according to Twitter, it's just uh, it's Florida State and Notre Dame did the Big Ten in like two weeks, right? Package deal, Bing Bang. I don't boom. know if it's going to be that quick. I know, it's just yeah, yeah, yeah. I th- you know, it just it just seems like everybody's all hot and bothered about uh about Bud's Knowles right now. You know, <laughs> and you, you get you get one too many filings, you get one too many Twitter lawyers. You know, you you, you start to feel like you can really you know see the matrix out there. Um, okay, one other thing before we hit a break and start to jump into our assistant coaching carousel recap, something that I am so grateful for the Cover 3 group chat for bringing this to my attention today because um, I missed this, but former Georgia Tech coach Paul Johnson was uh, taking place in an interview on the Bill Shanks show, and he had some thoughts. He shanked. On- On former Georgia Tech head coach uh, Jeff Collins. Of course, Collins was fired after midway through his fourth season. He had a 10 and 28 record um, with the Yellow Jackets. And he is also a part of our conversation coming up on the other side. He is now the defensive coordinator at North Carolina, uh, taking over there for Gene Chizik. We'll see if we got any thoughts on that as part of the assistant coaching care. So, recap, but here's a portion of what Paul Johnson had to say about Jeff Collins. Uh, he, meaning Collins, wanted to reinvent history. He just distorted everything when he got there. I would just call a spade a spade. I got no respect for the guy. He went in and distorted everything that was there, acted like we had not won a game, and lied about who he inherited. He lied about us not going into the high schools in Georgia, and then he told a bunch of whoppers, and it came back to get him. There was not much substance there. The opposing coaches in the league would call me and they were laughing, Johnson said. One particular coach really pounded them at home in Atlanta and told me, quote, Paul, it's a circus. He said it was hard for them to play the next week because of the physicality with the way my teams played. Another coach called me late on a Saturday night after a win and said, quote, I even lined up in your formation at the end, which would be the flex bone op- offense, just to rub it in the people who knew knew. A reminder that during his 11-year run with Georgia Tech, Paul Johnson led the Yellow Jackets to four ACC Coastal Division titles and two 11-win seasons. He was named the ACC Coach of the Year three times. But I know that I you know, bumped into Paul Johnson up at Grandfather Mountain uh, this past offseason. He's living a, a good life of, of golf and, and not dealing with the stresses of being the Georgia Tech head coach. But he's he's still got some fire there. He did not like the way he was treated, dude. Uh, yeah, and, and he's he's not wrong about the the way he was treated and, and the way his program was you know, referred to. Uh, look, I think if you're Georgia Tech, you see certain teams in your state try to go from good to great, and Georgia pulled it off. And Georgia Tech foolishly thought they could do a lot better than Paul Johnson, and they have come nowhere close since, and probably won't anytime soon either. Paul Johnson was just a really good coach. Jeff Collins had a good resume, and it just did not work out. Like I don't think that makes Jeff Collins a a bad guy. Did a lot of guys in the league dislike him? Yeah, for sure. They thought it was kind of you know kind of clownish, and the results certainly didn't help his reputation there. Uh, I don't I don't hate him as a defense coordinator. I never, never thought he did a bad job, you know, in that role. But a head coach is different, and uh, I mean, look, I, I think there was some validity to what Collins said uh, about Johnson's program. Because, of course, there's going to be, when you're transitioning from the triple option 
to a more whatever you want to call it, pro style or you know whatever. But if you're going to make that transition, you actually have to do it and nail it. And they they certainly uh, didn't. There's also a whole lot of factors there, man. I mean, that yeah, that, that that's a tough job. Paul Johnson did a great job with it, and we need more salty coaches like this. I mean, this is this is good drama for our sport. Yeah, I know. The truth is usually somewhere in between when you get both sides of it from what Jeff Collins was saying and what Paul Johnson was saying, Jeff Collins said. But to the one thing you said, there sure do seem to be a lot of coaches who don't like Jeff Collins. And at some point, there might be signal to the noise. So I don't know. It has nothing to do with his ability to coach, but we'll see. Like He's going to North Carolina right now to become defensive coordinator, but as we've talked about many times, Max kind of on a, you know, ticking, would we call it a hot seat or just like a ticking time bomb? Like it's going to come up here soon. Like he can't be there that much longer. So yeah, I was, I was going to ask about that. Um, like, I don't know how many show. big name DCs were going to be jumping at the North Carolina job. Whereas Jeff Collins, it was a job. It was available. It was offered to him. He took it. I don't know how sought after he was on the market. Because, I, I maintain, again, a lot of coaches really don't seem to like him. I, I maintain Chapel Hill is lovely. And a six-figure salary is probably fantastic, you know? And the trees look great in the fall. And, yeah, it's a good place. Good, pl good place to live. Good place to work. I'm sure that... Uh, I'm, I'm sure that Jeff Collins is excited to try to show what he can do, you know, imposing his mentality of defense uh, onto a group that has been very porous uh, for not only the Mac Brown tenure, but even the Larry Fedora tenure as well. So uh, something to, uh, to keep an eye on. Speaking of Jeff Collins, coming up on the other side, we break down. The assistant coaching carousel as best we can, including our top hires. And we got some big time turnover from teams that were in the college football playoff last year. So we'll break those down and more next. The madness doesn't just happen. Yo, get ready! And although it's marked on our calendars each year, it's built by moments of mayhem before. And the crowd goes crazy! And it begins to bubble long before it bursts. Sure, madness and marks may go hand in hand, but it starts right here. Do you want an update on the Marcus Camby situation? Yes. <laughs> okay, all right. So, latest poll data. Uh, of respondents, let me see here, 90% of folks 36 or older know who Marcus Camby is, while only 65% of people who are 35 or younger know who Marcus Camby is. So there is a distinct cutoff there. So we dropped 30 percentage points according to our uh, Pew Research data here in the Cover 3 tailgate. Uh, we appreciate everybody who jumped in to uh, to get us help with that all right uh look we were gonna do the assistant coaching carousel so i'm i'm gonna bring back mel tucker one more time <laughs> and dk in the house Damn. How was uh? How Danny, was? Do you know who Marcus Camby is? <laughs> were you talking about my trivia? I was asking you guys. <laughs> no, we were just talking about UMass. We want to know if you knew. Who oh he yeah, was. Okay, yeah. See, Danny's yeah. in the age range. He knows. That's right. <laughs> Absolutely, Marcus Camby, legend. So, like, do you think that your daughters would know who Marcus? No Camby chance. Is? No chance. Do you think anyone in your daughters, like peer group? No, no chance. <laughs> Teenagers? Right. Are you kidding me? Charlie D'Amelio, all over that. Marcus Camby, not so much. Who's Charlie D'Amelio? <laughs> that was perfect. Come on, get on TikTok. Give all your uh, info to China. Okay. We, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they've already got it. I don't we had it. We, we, we had the line at 35. This was a and if you're older than 35, you know who Marcus Camby is. Yes. And if you're younger than 35, your knowledge of UMass being a one seed contender in the NCAA tournament, you know, right. is, is mm -hmm. not going to be there. All but right. You got Walt Bell instead. <laughs> you, okay. And what else could you want? All right, so uh, we the the task, and just to go ahead and get us started, was for each of us 
Like who are, who's your five? Who's your top five? You can rank them. You can just give me your five. Uh, Danny, I will start with you. Your top five most notable assistant coaching hires of. Can we go, Tom first? No, no, no. All right. Okay, yeah, yeah. Not, I did my homework. <laughs> I appreciate the love and making sure that I did. Like, <laughs> hey, are you sure we have this? But I do have my list. All right, yeah, yeah. all right, cool. Uh, yeah. So, what, what's your what's your top five assistant coaching carousel moves? So, I did a list first before I researched it, like just off the top of mind. And so, I wrote them down. And I do think when they come to top of mind first, I do think that's the way I would rank them as well because the impact they could potentially bring to their programs. I have three offensive coordinators, two defensive coordinators. Number one, Penn State, Andy Colton and Nicky uh, from Kansas coming in. Um, Drew Aller was really good last year protecting the football, but if they can tap into his potential, I think it potentially could get Penn State to that level that they want to get to what everybody you know has kind of asked. Every Penn State we fan, what do we have to do to get past Ohio State, Michigan? And now it'll probably be Oregon, um, and Washington and USC and UCLA. Like, what do we do to take the next step? I think he's a huge part there. Number two, Colin Klein, Texas A&M. I thought it was a huge hire from Mike Elko. Again, similar Connor Wegman. We've heard about potential. I think Colin Klein, former quarterback, the job he's done at Kansas State was pretty impressive as well. Then I went defensive coordinator, Danton Lynn at USC. Obviously, Lincoln Riley needs some help on the defensive side of the ball. Him coming over across town from UCLA. Uh, I had this one. Some people might think it's low. The reason I had him lower, I had Chip Kelly at Ohio State coming in at four. Obviously, big name. It's an impact. And I think he helps them a lot. But I think they would have been – they're, they're going to be good either way. I think he does help them elevate a little bit. Like these other, these other ones, I think you could see a bigger impact on the program. Like Ryan Day was a really good offensive coordinator. I think Chip Kelly's a really good offensive coordinator. It might look different, but I don't know if it's this fast, different jump that all of a sudden Ohio State's going to make. And then lastly, I had Blake Baker, LSU, defensive coordinator coming from uh, Mizzou. We saw the problems LSU had last year. Kind of similar line of thinking with the Ohio State. Like LSU has a lot of talent. I think it'll make a big difference philosophically, toughness, uh, scheme-wise as well. But um, – I don't know if it's like a different, like definitive wins difference. Although maybe last year's defense, it was pretty bad. But I think it'll be a huge jump for uh, LSU getting Blake Baker. That was my five. I, I like it, but Bud, let's hear your five. Uh, I'm just going to add probably two more that Danny didn't have. Um, we'll run through one through five. It's good for social. Okay, sure. Oh, <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, Cotto Nicky, I think at Penn State certainly helps them quite a bit. M maybe sort of a a middle ground between the last two guys they've had in terms of like how structured and, and, and how creative. Uh, I think he's definitely gonna be able to create some nice throws for, for Drew. Uh, I'm going to go Joe Rossi at Michigan state. Actually. Uh, I, he just done such a nice job at Minnesota over the years. I know PJ flex an offensive guy, but Minnesota's offense has been hot garbage under PJ Fleck in almost every single year that he's been there. And the reason why PJ flex still has a job is Joe Rossi's defense bailing them out constantly year after year. So him getting to go coach with Justin at Michigan State, I, I think just does a, a really, uh, really impressive job there. I, a guy that I actually uh, have changed my tune on some, I'm going to put it in here, is Mike Denbrock. I, I didn't always love what they did at Cincinnati. I, I thought they could have uh, done more, but the part of this might be Joe Sloan with the progression, but I, I think they did a really nice job with Daniels. And if you look at it, Riley Leonard is an elite level runner and they did some nice things with, uh, uh, with, with the Cincinnati quarterbacks legs who got drafted by the Falcons. Yes. Desmond Ritter. Yes. It was crazy to take him where they took him, but anyway, uh, I, I thought nice things with his legs. So, uh, I like them a good bit there. That's a good get who else here. That's four. That's four. I'm going to go Jason Beck at New Mexico. I kind of always had a sneaking suspicion that he was the architect behind the changes that that UVA uh, ran under Bronco. So him reuniting with Bronco at New Mexico could be sneaky fun. All right, Tom, what you got? And we'll dive in on some of these individually. Not on my list, but the greatest thing Mike Denbrock did was he got to LSU and he looked at Malik Neighbors and said, okay, I'm going to put him in the slot and run slot fade 50 times a game and good luck <laughs> trying to cover him. And that pretty much worked to perfection. Uh, my number one is Chip Kelly. I think that makes plenty of sense. I don't know if I'd really need to go into detail on that. He's a very good offensive coach, and now he doesn't have to worry about all the BS he hates. He can just go draw plays and call them. 
and he's got Ohio State's talent. So that should probably work out well. But honestly, I feel like even if Bill O'Brien had been Ohio State's OC, it probably would have worked out well. Uh, I also have Andy Kotelnicki. That is a clean sweep. The one problem that Penn State has had the last few years, especially last season, was creating explosive plays on offense. They had to put together too many 8, 9, 10, 11 play drives to go score points. Andy Kotelnicki is explosive play after explosive play at Kansas. He will bring that to Penn State. I think that is a huge hire for them, and I think it really just overhauls what that offense can be. Uh, I also had Joe Rossi, Michigan State, D.C., on my list. I think that you look at Mel Tucker, like when they hired him, I thought, well, you know, even with his defensive background, we could probably expect, because their defense had been kind of eh for the last few years before he came in. I was like, they should be able to fix that at least in the offense. They'll take time to figure out the defense never got better under Mel Tucker. So I think Joe Rossi coming in who at Minnesota, like Bud talked about Minnesota's defense was the best part of that team the last few years. And they were sending guys to the NFL every single season. Tyler Newbin will be the next one going to the NFL. He'll be drafted in a couple months. I think losing him is a big blow for Minnesota. Uh, I also put on uh, Kane Womack going from South Alabama head coach to Alabama defensive coordinator. Kane Womack was a very good defensive coordinator at Indiana. It's how he got the South Alabama job. He learned under Tom Allen, who was another coach that I considered yeah. as Penn State's DC, but he didn't quite make the top five. I didn't want to have both Penn State coordinators in there, but those are two very good hires for James Franklin. And then finally, I'm going to a different USC coach. Give me Matt Entz, the <laughs> North Dakota State nice head coach leaving to become the linebackers coach at USC. Like, I like Danton Lynn. I think that what they did at UCLA was good. But I also don't think there was anything brilliant about it. I think that they just realized what they had, and they stuck with what worked, and it was effective for them. Bringing in Matt Entz, like, the parts of the USC defense that I looked at when you watch them play is just nobody has any idea what the hell they're doing. Like, they're just a bunch of chickens running around with their heads cut off back there, particularly in the secondary and with the linebackers. So to bring in Entz, who didn't build the North Dakota State dynasty by any means, but has been a part of it and has been a part of a defense that has been very solid fundamentally for a long time and has all those principles to come in and just coach the linebackers and also just the experience on that coaching staff in general, I think is going to be huge. It'll be a huge help to Lynn. It'll be a huge help to everybody. I think that's a huge hire, and I think Matt Entz is going to be a Power 5 DC in the short order. Ooh, all right. Chip Kelly, number one. And it's, it's not just about Chip Kelly. It is about alignment. I think this is an upgrade over what they would have had with Bill O'Brien. Um, it is also more of a fit because Justin Fry, the offensive line coach and run game coordinator at Ohio State, where did he get hired from? UCLA, where Josh Kelly and others emerged as really game-changing running backs. You look at the running back room that Ohio State has, absolutely loaded. So your offensive line coach, your offensive coordinator, they've been working together at UCLA, and they've been building productive rushing attacks. That is something that's great. More on the alignment is that Justin Fry also worked with Ryan Day back at Boston College. Like I, I just see that that you know that hive mind just being something that not that Bill O'Brien was not going to add expertise to it, but I just see a lot more alignment. So take Chip Kelly as it is, then look at the fit, uh, and I think that that's really strong. That's my number one. I've got Kodal Nikki as the number two as well. Great call on maybe Tom Allen jumping in there, and also if we spend this whole time talking about James Franklin making great hires on both sides of the ball, woo, buddy. The Nittany Lions fall short of expectations and don't beat a top 10 team this year. Uh, then we're, I know where we're pointing the blame. Uh, number three, Colin Klein at Texas A&M. Because Jimbo Fisher was such a hands-on, thumb-on-you kind of head coach, we haven't seen an offensive coordinator, especially a younger, newer mind when it comes to being an offensive coordinator, really take hold of the talent that we know is there at Texas A&M. Very excited to see what Klein can mean. I've got DeAnton Lynn at USC. Back to our initial discussion. It's it's about mindset, and I, I think the Lynn's going to be a good one there. And my number five is Elijah Robinson, the defensive coordinator hire at Syracuse. Really good recruiter at Texas A&M. And just like a, you know, sometimes it just falls into your lap. And where is Elijah Robinson from? Camden, New Jersey. One of the top defensive line coaches and recruiters in the SEC, someone who took over as the interim head coach of the Aggies, and and that team loved him, like they really loved him. And and now you've got the you know the familiarity with the Northeast. He's not going to be recruiting the same kind of players, but he's at least bringing those kind of recruiting chops. So I had uh, Elijah Robinson as my number five on the list. 
any notable admit, but any notable admissions that we didn't hit that you, you feel like we need to uh, dive back into as a headliner of the cycle? T Rob, uh, yeah. <laughs> I I know they missed on downs, but but T Rob going to UGA, uh, I I think is a a real coup for uh, for Kirby Smart there. Bobby Petrino, but like I really didn't add. I, I didn't have anybody on my list who went to a school that the industry sees as like really hot CD, you know, cause to me that suggests you don't actually have options. So like, I didn't take anybody that Florida took. I didn't take anybody Arkansas took like any staff that I'm like, yeah, that staff's definitely getting fired unless they really outperform. I didn't take anybody from there. Cause why would you go there? Right. If, if you're moving your family there, maybe get that multi-year extension. If you're Petrino, maybe, uh, you know, maybe you actually become the next head coach. Who knows? Did you guys have Matt Luke? I have him Clemson. on my under the radar. Okay. As the Clemson offensive line coach. Because Clemson's offensive line has been poop for a few years. Matt Luke hasn't been coaching the last couple of years, but last Matt Luke was coaching, he was very good at developing offensive linemen. So I think that's made a lot of sense for them. Do you remember when Clemson got beat by Ohio State? It was coming out about the offensive line and how little they've recruited there well. Do you think it's more about that or development, bud? I think both actually. Uh, you, yeah. you, you need a little bit better, high, like higher quality of clay. But they actually did step up the recruiting in terms of, of their overall talent level, and it really didn't pan out quite so much for them. Because um, there was a stat about how many first rounders Alabama had, Ohio State had. Like you went down the list, and Clemson, yeah. like their biggest was like a third rounder, and it wasn't like they haven't had very much offensive line NFL talent, which is kind of odd considering how much success they had. Yeah, they they, they hadn't had like like a high level. Offensive line pick. What well, Jackson Carmen was probably the is that the most recent guy they've had who was actually like pretty pretty highly picked. Did Hyatt get drafted high? Because that no, was not example. high. No. no, not not at all. Yeah, that was um, the example that put up red flags for me about the development side because he showed up with a college ready body. They started playing him at tackle as a true freshman, and he ended up playing a lot of snaps for teams that won a lot of games which gets you all conference votes because sometimes that's how it goes on the offensive line when you're just, I don't know, on the same offense as Trevor Lawrence and uh, Travis Etienne. But then NFL came around and NFL evaluators said no. And that's where I was like, okay, this might be a, this might be a development issue uh, along the way. Uh, Danny, do you think the Petrino thing has a, is it, is it cause he was just at Texas A&M. Right. Mm -hmm. So we already did our like Petrino back as an SEC offensive coordinator. Right. I had, are you cautious? Are you encouraged? What's what's the way that you're looking at this for uh, for Sam Pittman and the Hogs? Um, I hope it works for Sam Pittman's sake. I mean, it was already we, I was kind of curious to see if he had survived this past offseason. He does. So clearly this is maybe something to try to salvage it. You know, he's already, you know, Petrino had already been back as Arkansas as an opposing coach a couple times. So I think like it's kind of water on the bridge as far as history goes, but I think you got to put up some points, got to have some success, or else none of it's going to matter in a year. Yeah. You know? Did you just have Pat Shermer? No. <laughs> no, I did not have Pat yeah, Shermer on there. Did anybody <laughs> no, have Jeff I Collins? Did anybody have Jeff Collins? I had, uh, no. I, I had Jeff Collins as a category to mention. So I, let's mention. Yeah. <laughs> some guys, I will say, some guys, and this is a lot, it's really good football coaches, just aren't great head football coaches, but they can be really good coordinators. I think that's if you're Mac Brown, that's what you're hoping for. I, I kind of had him in, or I had North Carolina not in the, like, if they don't do well, they're definitely going to be fired category because I don't really trust that UNC is super serious about football in a way that like I think the Gators are. But I do think if you're a coach, you have to – if you ended up at North Carolina, what other options did you have, right? Like who else were you pursued by? Because you watch – Tom's been doing it. You watch this Drake May stuff. There's a lot of concerning stuff about North Carolina outside of Drake May. Like the drop-off there could be pretty substantial this year. Um, how long are you for that program? Can you actually – are you going to have good defense to be able to – to elevate out of there, I, I think know. North. I think North Carolina is. I think North Carolina at the administrative level uh, is serious about football. I think they are running into political issues, and I don't mean like red and blue. I just like mean booster. like like yeah, alliances yeah. and emotions. And in the same way that 
it was very difficult and awkward at the end of Mac Brown's run at Texas where you felt like it could be over at any minute, but it was actually like two more years. I, I think we might be at that situation with North Carolina where who knows, man, like I, I, I do not have a good idea of when everything will ultimately come to a head in North Carolina and or Mac Brown will decide that this has been a really good revitalizing run from a, you know, Larry Fedora wins five games across two years. I mean, that's, that's unacceptable at North Carolina. And he has at least raised the floor there, but this will be the floor. So what does the floor look like? Because you mentioned the drop-off. I mean, they are a middle-of-the-road FBS team on paper. They are fighting for bowl eligibility with those other teams in the ACC that are fighting for bowl eligibility. So we'll see if uh, Jeff Collins can help shore up a defense that does still have some talented players, but, uh, but boy, that's going to be a tough one right there. You want my hot North Carolina take? Love it. Let's hear it. It's not about next year. It's about last year. Way too much of a fuss made over Tez Walker. He just isn't that good. Sorry. He, he was one route. Bit better than what they had, though. Yeah, he runs one route. And if the ball's not going to him, he doesn't do anything. So, he also got some dropsies to him. Mm -hmm. Kind of deep on, on the deep stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. The was it? What oh, game was it? View. Oh, the Virginia game. Did you watch UVA yet from the All 22? Mm -hmm. Go watch. Like, Danny. Go pull up the UVA game and watch the throws that Drake May made and watch, like, just no help from the receivers. It's insane. Like, they, mm -hmm. they should have won that game going away, and they outright lost as, like, a three-score favorite to UVA it, because they just – UVA is like, yeah, you can't throw deep. Drake May is like, watch this. Laser, 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 laser. <laughs> and they dropped them all. It, it was freaking amazing. Travaris Robinson, I want to hit before we, like, bounce on headliners here. He was at the center of remember those Lane Kiffin comments. Yeah. You know, who's like, calling, hey, who's calling the D? Who's calling the D? I tell you what, it looks like T Rob was calling the D. And and I, you know, have have understood the the impact that Robinson has uh, as an important part of you know Georgia's uh, you know, what he can bring to that recruiting operation, what he can bring from his experience in that in that case. I mean, like Danny, do you think that do you think that's like a superstar hire? That's somebody that we're going to see continue to rise in the ranks because I mean, you get to Georgia and you're a Georgia assistant. Like that's a, that can be a springboard to uh, to bigger and better things along the way. Yes. A hundred percent. And the, the kind of the similar line of thinking why he didn't make my top five was because like you're in really good shape at Georgia. Like, are you going to be the difference? Like a Colton Nicky, who I think we all had on there was kind of somebody that jumped out. Yes. But I absolutely think he's somebody that's on this path this trajectory. And for him, I think it was a really smart move because Georgia is going to be favored to win it all next year. I think he could be like one of the next big hires that's made to another SEC school, potentially, you know, like that, that trajectory. Another headliner, uh, Bo Davis. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Get, getting him for LSU. I, I think is a pretty nice hire. Uh, that is a very, very nice hire uh, for LSU as they try to remake that. I had Blake Baker uh, on my list. I had T Rob. I had Petrino. I had Mike Denbrock. Any other thoughts on on Denbrock? But I thought you did a good job of sort of you know piecing together the what we knew from Cincinnati versus you know what we saw at LSU. Anybody else got a thought on Notre Dame's new offensive coordinator uh, as they as they bring him to uh, back to South Bend? Yeah, they're losing one awesome tackle and one pretty good tackle. And I do think that Dimbrock, if you go back and look what he did in 2022, not 23, 22 LSU had two true freshman tackles and they navigated that situation uh, pretty well throughout the course of the year. And it got better as the year wore on. So if I'm an Irish fan, I'm taking a lot of, of, of solace from that. Like, wow, our tackle situation this year is going to be massively downgraded, but Denbrock has recent experience of using a guy's legs to mitigate the, the step down in the quality of tackle play. Now, this year, LSU were awesome because they were no longer true freshmen, and both of them are going to be probably NFL uh, you know, fairly high picks. So I, I think you're, you're pretty heartened with that and his use of the QB mobility. Like I don't think people realize how athletic – I mean, a lot of us are ACC guys, so we get it. But if you're like at home, if you're an SEC guy, if you're a Big Ten guy, how much Riley Leonard have you watched? Like If he's not banged with the ankle – He's really athletic. Mm -hmm. 100%. I, I would expect it to look different, though, than what you saw at LSU, simply because a lot of what they do in the passing game last year at LSU was 
a lot of vertical routes because that was Jade and strength making those throws. I don't think Riley Leonard is that same kind of player. I don't think they have those same kind of receivers at Notre Dame. I mean, and that's now Notre Dame fans don't crap your pants. I'm not saying your receivers suck. I'm just saying they're not Malik neighbors and they're not Brian Thomas and they're not all those guys LSU has. So I would expect it to look different than you mentioned the tackles. I don't know how much time you'll have to have Riley Leonard standing back there waiting for those routes to come open. So I, I think it'll be effective. It just won't look like the LSU offense that we saw this year. Their win total is 10 and a half, by the way. Their schedule is light. Like it is set up to be. Now it's juiced to the under, but I mean, I think they have three big games, like, and starts off at Texas AM. I run like that one's one they may chalk up as a loss. I don't know what that, that's going to be an interesting game. And then it's Florida State and USC. I think they're three toughest opponents. And then they're going to be pretty heavy favorites in most of their games. If you look at it, Notre Dame has done a really good job. Like they don't lose in recent years, for the most part. The Marshall the AC- and Stanford. Like yeah, like like, like the ACC. The well, okay, yeah. I, I... Did we lose six five? and six? Notre Dame is going six and six. <laughs> Clip it, put it out there, send it around. Michael, if you're in the chat, that one's for you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, look, a lot's going to be on Riley Leonard because yeah. Jaden Greathouse, Jaden Thomas, Jordan Faison, Bo Collins arrives from Clemson. I just listed players that you can talk yourself into, but I did not list any players that are jumping to the, to the front of any lists where you're like, that is going to be a difference maker that I am confident in. So they just need a couple of those guys to step up and really be difference makers, but I'm, uh, I'm, I'm not entirely positive. All right, bud, can we get an audio check? No okay. audio. No audio. Okay. Um, well, oh, they, they got to him. Then Michael Campbell got to Bud. He heard him about to say something bad about Notre Dame, and he cut the audio on. <laughs> All right, let's, let's, let's hit a break, and, and then uh, we'll come back on the other side and break down some under-the-radar moves, uh, grade some of the big-time new staffs from the new hires, and much more as we wrap up the assistant coach at Carousel next the madness doesn't just happen. Yo, get ready! And although it's marked on our calendars each year, it's built by moments of mayhem before. And the crowd goes crazy! And it begins to bubble long before it bursts. Sure, madness and marks may go hand in hand, but it starts right here. Back here on the Cover 3 podcast as we continue to wrap up the assistant coaching carousel lots of moves still to uh, be made but a good chance for us to sit down and take a look at some of the moves that are significant for the 2024 season so um sharon moore had his hands full you know you've you've got jim harbaugh going to the nfl and you've also got jim harbaugh taking a good portion of the staff now washington jed fish shows up and you know that most of that staff was initially going to be going to Alabama. Now some of them are at the NFL. One coach at Tennessee. You no, know, he had to rebuild there in Seattle. Uh, Texas A and M, of course. Mike Elko puts together a staff that we've already had a little bit of conversation about here. I want to get to Jay Bateman in a little bit. And Kalen DeBoer. Woo! What a roller coaster it was trying to put together that staff. As it looked like he was going to be bringing the whole brain trust from Washington. Three of the coaches that were projected to be on that staff initially uh, are off. That, of course, would be offensive coordinator Ryan Grubb, offensive line coach Scott Huff there with the Seahawks, and then linebackers coach uh, William Inge is now going to be with Tennessee. Uh, Danny, of the new hires, uh, Michigan, Alabama, Washington, Texas A&M, which of those staffs has really uh, jumped out to you in terms of you know feeling like somebody did a good – one of these new coaches did a good job of uh, putting it together? You know, you mentioned Alabama's bumpy ride to get where we are. I like the Kane Womack hire, but the Sheridan hire as the offensive coordinator, I don't know if it matters that much because it's going to be DeBoer's system. And I was like, yeah, it was solid. Uh, Michigan felt very much like, hey, let's just keep kind of keep things in place. I know they brought in Martindale from the NFL with that Ravens pipeline that's kind of there. Is it crazy to say Jed Fish is kind of making waves? Like at Washington, no. as far as the staff? Like bringing in Steve Belichick to be the defensive guy, like I, I'd say his was probably one of the more off, you know, one of the more eyebrow raising. Like, oh, okay, you know, maybe Jed Fish can actually, you know, keep this thing. I don't want to say rolling. I don't think they're getting back to the playoffs because they lost so much talent. But I'd say from a building a staff perspective, I'd say Washington might be the most impressive 
especially considering like later in the game, what he was working with. Um, I'd say, I'd say Jed fish was impressive. Of those staffs, my favorite sell goes at AM. Yeah. I just, he, he brought in a lot of guys who I just like, and I think they're going to hit the ground running there and do pretty well. I think he upgraded it a couple spots with what was there on the other staff. Yeah. So I think that's a good job for the Aggies. Uh, for Michigan's, I had to write a story on it. I don't think it's bad. I do have question marks because like, I, I think getting Brian G. Mary from Tennessee is a big one because he's a great recruiter. And I think that that was the one thing with Sharon Moore's staff. Like he's bringing in a lot of coaches. I don't know how many great recruiters he had. So getting Gene Mary in there is big. I don't know the situation. Nobody knows the situation yet. I don't think with Mike Hart, like he's still currently the running backs coach, but I don't know if he's going to be the running backs coach by the time the season starts next year. And I have concerns about Wink Martindale as the defensive coordinator at Michigan, because yeah, it's the same Ravens tree, but Wink Martindale left Baltimore and was replaced by the guys who were quote unquote, the branches on his tree because Wink Martindale's defenses at the end of his tenure in Baltimore weren't doing very well. He's This is now going to be his third job in four seasons. It's college, which he hasn't coached at in like 20 years since he was on Jack Harbaugh's staff at Western Kentucky in 2003. And he is very, very aggressive. And I don't know if he can be as blitz heavy at, co- at the college level or if he should be considering the defensive talent he should have in that front seven as he has to be at the NFL where maybe you have to do more to generate a consistent pass rush. So that is going to be a very interesting one for me. I think all the other hires are either solid to good and Wink Martindale is the one that's kind of eyebrow raising for me. It's like, I don't know, that could be really great or that could blow up in their face. Was Was Wink essentially kind of pushed out in Baltimore? That's kind of how we read it. Uh, no, I think that they he was pushed out in New York. He was definitely but, pushed out in New York. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I don't I I think it was kind of a mutual kind of Harbaugh J, J not or not John, sorry. John. There's so many Harbaugh's J, John, Jim, Jack. Can't Jack. somebody be named Mike or Jackie? <laughs> but anyways, um I think it was just they wanted to try new stuff. I, so I don't, it kind of, maybe not pushed out, but kind of just, you know, slightly nudged a little bit, little elbow in the side there. Kind of like when you're boxing out for a rebound, you just kind of get the little chicken wing to get yourself yeah. some leverage. Yeah. Um, did you invoke the name Todd Grantham in your piece uh, about Michigan? No, I didn't read. I don't want to terrify Michigan fans, but okay. it does like, you could see that kind of situation. Cause like, if it's, if it's going to be like a third in Grantham, Oh, he's bringing seven or eight guys every single time. We've seen what happens when you face good college teams. And it's like, okay, well, we'll just pick up your blitz and tear apart your secondary. Uh, bud, glad to have you back. Glad we got that worked out. Hey, let's, uh, can we go back to the Texas A&M part of this? Cause I want to hit the, uh, uh, Kyle from the cover three tailgate says, can you talk about Jay Bateman? Who's the defensive coordinator hire for Texas A&M L- love the Colin Klein hire, but not sure what to think on Bateman. Can't tell if he's a good DC who is in a bad situation at UNC or if that's message board coping. I think I loved him exactly in Army. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I thought he was good at Florida. Yeah. Agreed. And I, I thought he was good at army. I think it's mostly just, you know, like we talk about, can, can you run a good defense at USC? Can you have a hard-nosed defense under Mac Brown? I don't know. It's been like 20 years since they've had one. So my guess is probably no. And I I think this would echo what Tom said, where it, you're looking at Mike Elko's staff, and individually, it's a lot of coaches that you have been impressed with over the years. Mm-hmm. Also, it's Mike Elko as the coach. Like His imprint on the defense will be there. He's not all of a sudden going to go hands off and not, you know, be able to be an intricate part of the game planning, the preparation, and being able to make sure that that Texas A&M team is dialed in to get ready to stop whoever Texas A&M is playing. So I, I think A, Jay Bateman's a good coach, but B, I've got just confidence in, in that sort of, you know, again, that, that partnership uh, as well. I mean, Elko, like, he hasn't been in the game that long, but you look at, like, who he's worked under and who's worked under him. He's got a pretty impressive kind of, I don't, it's probably too young. He's got a really impressive coach coaching sapling. I don't know if we can call it a tree yet, but it's a sapling. Agreed there. Um, Josh Crawford going to UGA is interesting as well to me. I just, just, I, I was going to bring it up when, when, when my mic uh, went out, but if you're Kirby, obviously you're pretty close to Atlanta. You see what Crawford was doing at Georgia tech. You're impressed by it. You go pluck him off. Good move. 
any other uh Danny any, any other sort of under the radar hires or or you know names that we haven't mentioned yet here in this coaching carousel cycle I don't think so did you guys put grades on Alabama did we grade them chip gave I, them an a plus <laughs> I did I give them an a plus I am um I am nonplussed. <laughs> <laughs> I I think that there is a with this staff, you you look at Kalen DeBoer and you're like, man, that was a was a really tough position to be in. And you feel like that, you know, Nick Sheridan, remember he was the offensive coordinator after um Kalen DeBoer at Indiana for you know more Michael Penix success years. Ty Freifogel, you know, he was the uh, that when he was the Big Ten pass catcher of the year, that was when Nick Sheridan was the offensive coordinator. He was a tight ends coach at Washington, and he was supposed to be a tight ends coach at Alabama. And if he was the tight ends coach at Alabama, it'd be awesome. He's the offensive coordinator. All right. We'll, we'll see how this goes right here. You know, on the defensive side, you have a lot of experience. I mean, you've got former two former head coaches, and you've got two other coaches who have been coordinators. And so my big takeaway on the Alabama staff is you've got all these different guys with all these different experiences, but it is like mixing and matching along the way. I have heard Kalen DeBoer is really good at the people stuff, like management of his staff, empowering his staff, the people who work for him really like him. He is going to have to avoid a cooks in the kitchen scenario with all these guys who are used to having their voice be one of the most respected in the room. So can he get everybody in line. That is a, that is a challenge for a group that, you know, exact responsibilities are a little bit difficult to figure out. And that's probably contractual stuff, but there's a lot of coaches that are used to having their, their voice be the final one or one of the final ones. So can DeBoer keep them all in line? That's probably my uh, C plus. We'll see what happens. Kind of read on the situation. Yeah, I, I feel like I was negative on this in some ways. Like I think Mo Linguist was going to get fired at Buffalo, barring some sort of miracle. And I definitely think Kane Womack missed his window to win at South Alabama because Summerall and Troy just beat him every year. And they were one of the best teams in, in the Sun Belt. They just happened to play in the same division as the best team in the Sun Belt. But that doesn't mean those guys are poor coaches or poor hires. Almost everybody gets fired at Buffalo. It's very hard to win there. So... Uh, and and I, I think Womack overall did a pretty good job. I think Jamarcus Shepard is a really nice hire for them. You can't give it a crazy high grade because they lost the O-line coach in the OC to the NFL. If they had kept those two together, I'd feel really, uh, really pretty damn good about it. Is it better than the staff that Nick Saban had for his final year or two? Ooh, that's a good question because I was not uh, very Just impressed. assistance, just assistance. I'm not going to put DeBoer in the Saban category. No, you can't. By but the, the way, assistance. Hey, have y'all have y'all have y'all walked walked on ice with this one? Y'all know the uh, the other. There's three co-defensive coordinators for Alabama. Have, have y'all tried to say this one yet? They've got like a triumvirate. Yeah, they do. His yeah. name is Colin Hitchler. Yeah. Okay. Be really, really careful with that one. <laughs> Wait, you've got a triumvirate, and one of them's named Hitchler. Yeah. Oh no. <laughs> and I've seen this movie before. <laughs> Colin Hitchler came from the fickle tree. He was with them at Cincinnati for a long yeah. time, like, you know, helped build that out, goes with them to Wisconsin. So the, the pedigree, you know, checks out. Um, Hitchler also, uh, I think, has like Eastern Michigan and Southern Illinois, but not at the same time that Kalen DeBoer was there. So there must have just been like some mutuals along the way. Um, again, Three defensive coordinators, all with like a lot of experience of, of being like big time up there, and we'll just see how they all work together. But only one of them doesn't have co. The only the only one that doesn't have co is Kane Womack. Right. Who I do think is the guy that's gonna be running the defense. I do agree with that. And I think he's good. I think he's a solid hire. Where did some of these guys end up? Like I, how good was this last Saban staff? Um, Steele out of the game. T Robbins up at Georgia. Uh, Tommy Reese is uh, in the NFL. NFL, yeah, I think Bears maybe. Ro Robert Bala went to Washington. 
that's uh, strength and conditioning or sports science or Joe, right? Joe, Joe Cox went to Ole Miss. Yeah. I, it's an interesting proposal. Like, like Kalen and DeBoer, we're kind of sitting here C plus. I don't know there's there. a right answer by the way. Yeah. Like Eric, Eric Walford went back to Kentucky where he had previously been. The difference is in Cleveland. Yeah. The difference being Nick Saban versus Kalen DeBoer. If you feel like there's yeah. not a major drop off at the assistant level, well, the, then the drop off is then at head coach. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I just, all right. I'm not, I'm not convinced it's an enormous drop off at the assistant level from what they had. I guess we'll, we'll see. We'll um, see. Jamarcus Shepard did a great job at Washington. <laughs> so, so very, 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 uh, very easy to be able to sell that one to uh, other wide receiver prospects, be they from the transfer portal uh, or from high school. Are there any other names you want to throw before we get out of here? Yeah, so uh, under the radar names that I, I think are good. Um, G5 coordinators who I think were probably big wins that they didn't take position coach jobs in the P5. Uh, I think Summerall keeping Gasparato, by the way, I, I know it's kind of Summerall's defense, but like you got to give him like some credit for the job he's done there. Uh, we all sat here and laughed at, at how it looked like the Miami, Ohio quarterback was, was literally throwing a vase in, in the Mac title game and they still won. Well, the, uh, the linebackers coach Joe Bowen got hired away by Pete Limbo to go run his own defense at Buffalo. So like that could work pretty well. And then Bronowski, uh, the special teams uh, coordinator is now the special teams coordinator at Pitt. So apparently Nar Narduzzi and Limbo uh, were watching that Mac title game as well. I already mentioned uh, Jason Beck in New Mexico. Um, shoot. Who else here? Oh, we talked about this at the time the hire was made. I thought Tyson Vite to Cincinnati was pretty good. Like that guy, he could have been the heir apparent to the DC at Iowa State if and when their DC ever hangs it up. Um, who else did I put on here? We haven't talked about yet. Oh, uh, Abdul Rahim going from Boston College and not following Halfley to the NFL and, and Loxley getting him is a pretty nice get for you know Maryland's recruiting efforts in DC. Got it. I got a few. All right, let's do it. Uh, I mentioned Matt Luke earlier. I also mentioned Tom Allen as the defense coordinator at Penn State. A couple others. Uh, Ole Miss hiring George McDonald to coach wide receivers got him from Illinois, where he did a very good job developing their guys. And before that, he was at the NC State and did a very good job developing guys there. So I think that is a big one for Ole Miss because wide receivers are pretty important for that team. And then also, this is just an interesting one for me. Uh, South Carolina hired Joe DeCamillis as its special teams coordinator. Joe D has been like coaching special teams since I was five. And he's been doing a very good job of it. And I just think that you think of Shane Beamer, Frank Beamer, Beamer ball, how important special teams are. So I think that could be a pretty kind of big hire for them under the radar with the Gamecocks. And then this one wasn't a hiring as much as it was a firing. And it might be one of the biggest moves of the offseason, depending if you ask their fan base, who probably more excited about this than they were about Chip Kelly. Ohio State firing special teams coordinator Parker Fleming sent cry you know tears of joy all throughout columbus in the state of ohio because oh my god did that fan base hate that man yeah special teams not what not great for uh for the ohio state buckeyes so uh, i'm sure they're glad that they tightened that up you I know have, do you know sorry, what joe DeCamillis is famous for besides being the special teams coordinator my rookie year with the new york giants he is the son-in-law of, of now deceased uh, Dan Reeves, mm -hmm. to, uh, yep. his daughter. He's a really good dude. He's a he's an outstanding. Like he is a football lifer who's one of the better special teams coaches in the game. So mm -hmm. he's also he was also one of the coaches that was injured really badly in the Dallas Cowboy bubble collapse probably about yep. a decade uh, ago. Yeah, oh, he was hurt really bad in that. But he's bad. I mean, he's he's fine now. But it was pretty dicey for a little bit. Um, a couple more here. So. Uh, shoot. What's the name of the guy of the, like the 28 year old from Jack state who Venables hired at OU? Oh, um, you're talking about cause Jack state personnel yes. wise was terrible in the FCS. That and, defense was um, awesome. Um, shoot. Uh, hold on, let me look it up. Hold on. Alley, alley. Cause I, I remember, I remember thinking, yeah, the, the, those, those guys definitely run the alley. It's something alley. Zach Zach alley. alley. Okay. There you go. I give Venables a shout out. Um, for that one. Also, Glenn Thomas 
I have no idea if Glenn Thomas is a good head coach or not, but like if we're flipping coins, it allowed Nebraska to move Marcus Satterfield from quarterback coach and full OC to like co and go be the tight ends coach, which is definitely a downgrade uh, in terms of like, anyway, Nebraska doesn't have Marcus Satterfield coaching quarterbacks anymore. I'm all in on whoever else they want to put in there. So Glenn Thomas for me, blind resume, don't know. I think he's an upgrade. I feel like Danny, I'm going to finish on her list. <laughs> <laughs> she has to use my printer for, uh, for some homework. <laughs> She did ask. I feel like I'm following a jam band on tour, and it's been months since I heard Bud play the Marcus Satterfield song, and I am just losing it. <laughs> over here. Anymore, he's not That's... coaching quarterbacks. I, I have no opinion on his ability to coach tight ends. <laughs> <laughs> um, Thursdays are our interactive show. That means we'll be grabbing some questions from the big old bag of mail, where if you leave us a five-star review, put that question in the review. We'll tackle it in a future mailbag episode. And – the Cover 3 tailgate shows up strong. So we'll be taking your questions. Uh, come hop in early. Drop your questions in the chat, and we'll be sure to get to them. A couple early birds, and then all throughout the show. It's a mailbag episode, one of the best times of the week. And you can follow him on Twitter at Tom Fernelli. You can follow him at Danny Cannell. You can follow him at Bud Elliott 3 You can follow me at Chip underscore Patterson. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Forza Napoli. <laughs>